would like to introduce. Wait, I never heard this before. They used to say to the Jewish people in Poland, wait until Hitler gets here? Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. So do you remember like hearing about the Nazi party like on the radio and on the yeah, TV? You read the papers. You read the papers every day. You, could, you, you knew what was going on. Right. I know exactly when they chased out the Jews from Poland who went to Germany before the war mm -hmm. and they established themselves in Germany and some of them were pretty well off and when Hitler came to power he took all those Jews who didn't know anything about Poland anymore they were German mm -hmm. took them to the border and Push them over to the other side and says, that's it, go back home. Then, wow. then they came back, some of them had family, some of them didn't have any more family. The, the, there is no word in the vocabulary right. to describe the, the viciousness of the Germans. It's impossible to understand. In the camp, you had about a peel every day at, uh, in the afternoon. In the morning, you had to get out of the barracks, line up. Rain, snow, mud, nothing. Uh, you had to line up outside. If you didn't line up and they, they caught you in the barracks still when the other people were outside, you were, you were finished. You. Oi. You were reported to the to the big shot. So you could never be late no. for anything. Oh no, God forbid. Boy, I'm always ten minutes late for everything. <laughs> I think it's because I'm a. They say I'm an optimist, so I always think I can do so much, and then I realize like, oh, I gotta go. But you know, there's so many stories floating around in that yeah. in that head. That uh, would people. This might be a stupid question, but in the camp. Would would people date? Like, would people be in relationships? Like, even... No, the only ones which were in relationships were the man who, he was a couple. Okay. You, know what, you know what a couple is, right? Um, a Jewish person a who Jew, would a Jewish policeman, other Jews a Jewish policeman, to the Nazis. A Jewish policeman. He... Uh, he did whatever the Nazis were supposed to do, he did it for the Nazis. And then they eventually too got killed, right? Yeah, eventually too. I had one of my cousins was a policeman. One of your cousins became a Jewish, a Jewish policeman, policeman, a Papa? Because his sister worked for the Germans. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll tell you just the way it was. So, the day of the, when they sent away the Jews from our hometown, mm -hmm. they marched them through the city to the railroad station. And the policeman, the Jewish policeman helped mm -hmm. to watch that nobody escapes or whatever. And that cousin of mine, when they, they had 120 people. And um, if some, if, uh, if there were not enough people, you know, they were going by wagon, 119, he was there staying next to the thing. Bush, they put them up there, so it didn't make any difference. Policeman, wow. no policeman. Yeah, just to get them out of there. Right. So how old were you when you went into Auschwitz? What I know about Auschwitz, not a lot of people know this, but it's the only camp that gave people... The tattoos. Not all of the Auschwitz people had the tattoos. Because right. Because those tattoos were given in 1944. 1944. And in 1944, is already they 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 had an inkling. They had an inkling that they losing the war. Some uh, uh, Hungary. Mm -hmm. 
Hungary was, and they were in Hungary, the Jewish, the Jews in Hungary were there until 1944, and they were not touched. And then on the end, Eichmann, mm -hmm. you heard about Eichmann. Yeah. Eichmann made sure that they all was sent to Auschwitz. Right. And, so and the, for those listening, Eichmann was the architect of the final solution yeah, of yeah, how to yeah. kill all the Jews. Right. Let me explain to you something. When they started the, the, the campaign of killing Jews, mm -hmm. so they killed them with a gun. They killed 10 Jews, they could kill 20 Jews, they could kill 50 Jews, mm -hmm. right? But that was not enough because they had to kill a lot and they don't, didn't have the possibility how to do it. Right. So I don't know if you heard about it. The next thing was that they took the, uh, a bunch of Jews, they put them on a truck, on a closed-up truck, and they packed them in there, and they took a pipe from the exhaust pipe from the gasoline mm -hmm. burning, and they killed them that way. They, they get, you never heard of it? No. Oh, yeah. And then the people were dead in there, they took them to the next river and they jumped them into jail. Well, it's it's uh, mind-boggling. It's for a human being not to understand. Yeah. Um, I started to tell you a story about the uh, we had to stay in line and they were counting us. And the count, you know, German, it has to be so many in the morning. Someone in the afternoon. So when the big boss came down, they gave him a report. So they told him there are 550, there are 10 in the hospital, there are two dead or whatever. Mm -hmm. Now, one day, uh, also there was the punishment if they, somebody did something wrong. And those are individual things that I want to tell you. Yeah. There was a, a girl from my hometown, and she was a beauty. And a German uh, watchman, you know, she was a beautiful girl, so he was allowed to take her to clean her apartment and to do her things around the thing. But whatever else they did, I, I don't want to know. I'm not interested. So every day when she was ready, finished with her work, she had to leave and go through a watchman, to a German watchman, back into the camp because those policemen lived on the out, outside of the camp. Wow. So she passed by. So and she was probably having to prostitute herself, is what you're saying. That, that's one thing. That's one thing. That's for sure. They had they had a house of prostitutes, of girls, and they send in the German soldiers there. So with this particular girl, so they found the margin, and so they reported it to the big shot. So the big shot had given her a punishment of twenty-five whips on her naked behind. In front of 4,000 people, she had to undress, put her panties down, and they gave her 25 whips. Uh, you're talking about cruelty, I'm just telling you. There was another case of uh, he, uh, that, that, that big shot, he punished somebody who stole a little yarn. He worked as a, as a cop, and not a carpenter, but a, uh, a seamstress? Well, so, uh -huh. so he had so he would, had some yarn, so he put it in the pocket because he wanted to fix something in the evening when he's going to get back. They found that yarn, 25 whips. So the Germans didn't give him the whips. The Germans brought over anybody who was near there, come here. Give them 25 whips. So he counted one two, three, four, five, and then the Germans saw that the Jew didn't want to hurt that man 
whipping them so hard that it hurts. So he said to him, I tell you what, let's stop. He says, now you go on the table. They had a table closed like this. And let me explain to you. Not as big, smaller. And what they did is they had a board down here. So you had to put your feet there, your feet there, and you had to lay like this. They took one guy to hold his hands because uh, if, not, if it hurts, he would get up maybe right. to hold his hands. So the guy, they took a Jew to do the whipping and the Jew did not whip as hard as he should. So if the German says to the Jew, he said, now you come and lay down and I'll show you how to whip. I mean, the cruelty is beyond. Ilya Wiesel tells his story, if you re read his book, that when he came, he saw that they, they brought wagons of children and they just dumped them into the fire. Yeah, I, I, I learned about that. Yeah. And they would have these big pits and right. all the, the Polish people would, would see these big garbage, literally garbage trucks coming in with, with babies and then would dump them into a grave. And you know, for me, the first time I went to Poland and I saw concentration camps and I saw houses next to the concentration camp, my first reaction was, who the hell would want to live next to a concentration camp? But then I realized people have always lived next to the concentration camps. So just like people saw the trucks, you know, of the babies, they're, were also people living next to what were essentially death factories. I don't know. I, I, I can't. It's impossible <coughs> for a normal human being right. to comprehend it because it is not human Polish people. Mm -hmm. And we lived on the outskirts of the town, actually. When the Germans came in and they started up, first they created a ghetto. And the ghetto was in the center of the town. So then one day, you wake up in the morning and they have signs there. And they say, Jews are not allowed to walk on the sidewalk. That was the first. Yeah. You had to walk in the middle of, uh, of the road where the horses go and the, and the cars. There were no cars actually. All the Jews which live outside of the ghetto have to go into the town. You have to leave your apartment yeah. and leave everything you have and you walk into the... How old were you when you moved to the ghetto? Probably about 14, 15 years. So you, you, you remember it? Oh yeah, no question. I remember it very well. What happened to your mother when she decided to walk on the sidewalk? Well, they beat her up and she came back and she was full of blood. And, you know, a kid like me seeing his mother bloody like this, it was something that it stuck in my mind all the time. Uh, and how did it go from then the ghetto to okay. the camp? So now we had to go from, from their homes to the ghetto. In the ghetto, they put us in, in an apartment. There were three rooms, a kitchen, a, a, a dining room, and a bedroom. Mm -hmm. A family occupied the kitchen, and a family, everybody slept on the floor because there were no beds, you know? And it was a commotion already. It was just as many people as you can put in a place. Right, right. And, uh, so uh, we, we were there for a while, and then one day, everybody out in the street lined up five in a row. So everybody went out to the street, and we lined up was my father, my mother, my two sisters, and myself. Mm -hmm. My brother was a painter, so the night before, they did not send them in back to the ghetto. They kept them out there. Okay? So we were five. 
and we are walking towards the railroad station in our hometown. And on the way they make an announcement, all boys 18 to 25 should step out of line. Well, I was one of them, but I didn't want to step out because who wants to be separated from, from his family? In a situation like this especially, right? right. I am not listening to what they said, and I walked further. And as I walked further, a little further, I am grabbed by the neck and pulled out of the line by a German. And that was the last time I had seen my family. They took me and they took another 39 boys or 40 boys together, almost about my age. And what we had to do, listen to this, you have to understand. We had to go to each and every apartment in our city with the German. And the German came with his machine gun. And wherever he found a living person hiding, or an old grandma lived with you and she was sick, she was in bed all the time, it happened, that was normal. So when they came in with with those boys, with us, they went ahead and whoever was alive or, or whoever they found alive, they shoot. We had to take out those dead bodies of those people, put them on a truck on the street, then drag the truck to the cemetery, dig a big hole. Wait, you drag the truck? Yeah. Wow. Yeah, oh, sure. With Not many, me, there how were, many, there how were many bodies? Few. There were a few, a few boys. And we had to... How many dead bodies on the cart, you think? We, we loaded up as much as they could, whoever we found. So you're talking about cruelty. It, it's beyond any comprehension of a normal human being. So then, <clears throat> that's when I was talking before about my cousin who was a policeman, mm -hmm. and at the railroad station, there were not enough people, boom, you go wow. with them. If you, have you ever, like, is there anything that you've ever smelt that triggered, like if you smelled like hair on fire, is, have you ever had an experience after the war where... Oh God, not after the war, during the war. In Auschwitz, in Auschwitz, the chimneys, there were four chimneys, and they were 24 hours, the fire was spitting out of the, of the burning, burning of the dead bodies, because they had the crematoriums, they, the people came in, they were guests, and they were put into the ovens, and that was it. it. Now, I remember the last time we hung out, you mentioned to me your wife, that you had actually seen her in the camp? Well, uh, we came to another camp, the first camp in Poland. I am from a different city, she's from a different city. I mm -hmm. didn't know her, she didn't know me. But in, in that camp, we were a little bit free. That was a working camp, not a concentration camp. So Auschwitz was, was afterwards a concentration camp. After. From there. And only concentration camps were people murdered, and most of the camps were work camps. All right. Okay. So we were first in that working camp, and then the, uh, the Germans had started to retreat. So there were also people marching. You know, they had bunches. I have pictures of them, but I don't know if I can give them to you, show to you now. We were marching and five in a row. And they were telling us that we're going to the Tyrolean Mountains because that was close to Munich and all those camps. Mm -hmm. And from time to time, they stopped us. So we were marching there and we came into Dachau. And Dachau, they said, okay, now we're going to relax a little bit. And then an hour or two hours later, they said, okay, everybody, whoever is able and willing, get up, we're marching, marching to the Tyrolean Mountains. That's when my brother and I gave up. No more. 
We couldn't. We didn't have any food already for days. We didn't have any water. We didn't have anything. So I will never forget we were laying on, on the grass there. I was so tired that when they, when they got me to, to pick up those dead bodies, I came back and I slept on the floor in the Jewish gymnasium. And the next morning, about 7 o'clock, 8 o'clock in the morning, a kid comes in running from the outside and he says, there are no more Germans on the watchtowers. You know the watchtowers. Mm -hmm. You saw that on different pictures. And I went out, and sure enough, there were no, no watchmen in the watchtowers. So that was the day of my liberation. How old were you? Well, 16? Uh, no, 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 I was more than 20. Got it. I was more than 20. So, um, and then from there, how did you come? Then, to then uh, that was the day. And I, mind you, I told you I was not with my brother. My brother was held back with the other people there in the place where he worked. Right. So the next morning, I get up and people were laying on the floor, dead people, living people, half dead people. So briefly, how did you get from Poland to America? And okay. then from there, I want to ask you questions about okay. business and raising kids and what gives you joy from the day of your liberation. So, so we the, the kid came out and we went out and we saw that they are not there. And they had on the corner, they had assembled about 35 German watchmen who watched those towers, the Americans put them in a corner and the officer, the American officer had said, he pulled out two guys from the soldiers. He says, you watch them that nobody runs away. I have to go to my boss and find out what the hell, you know, American way you have to get the permission. What am I doing? What is my next step? Yeah. The soonate he turned around and went to his boss, those two Jewish boys had the machine guns and they mowed out all 32 Germans. <laughs> so he came back screaming, cry, you go for the, you go on the, you know, you be uh, punished or whatever. They didn't give a damn. <laughs> wow. Anyway, anyway, so I was, uh, I was liberated and that night I slept on the floor. The next morning, I walked down to the to the to the big uh, big yard. Mm -hmm. That was a gymnasium, a Jewish gymnasium, and I went to the close to the fence. The fence was not electrified anymore, and I see a, a guy coming in from the outside already. And he's got a bag with bread, margarine, rolls, something else. So I said to my brother, let's get out of here. <laughs> so we got out of there and we started to march. No country. Where, where do you go? Where are you? Where's your home? You don't have any. Right. And there, there's no GPS. And there's nobody to talk to. So I said, I look up in the sky and I said, where do I belong? Where am I? Anyway, we walked and we came into the first house. And we saw the, the buttons to the bell, so we rang one, and a German came out with a gun. So I said, I don't want to be killed now, so we ran away. Wow. We went into the, to another uh, house, and we knocked at the door, and a woman opened up. And I speak fluently German, so I said to her, pour a pot of hot water, because we were infested with millions of lice. Wow. crawling all of our bodies, wherever there were hair, there were lice, and the, 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 the stuff you wore was infested with. So we threw this up and we washed ourselves, and I said to her, now give us from your husband something to put on, because we were naked, right? So she gave us some clothes of his, then I said to her, now we're hungry, you got to cook. <laughs> So she cooked us a little piglet, 
And believe me, it was the best thing. But if you're going to read books about the Holocaust, you're going to find out that a lot of survivors who survived the war died the first few days after they were liberated. The reason they died is their stomachs were not used to normal food. Or so and much they, of it. They started to eat the normal food and they, and they died. Mm -hmm. Thank God my brother and myself were all right. My brother got a little bit sick. <laughs> he got sick, so he had to take care of his bowel movement. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I told you the way it is. Yeah. Under, in the street, you could see any kind of car. A, 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 never mind Volkswagen. The, the, the most expensive cars were standing in the street with nobody because when the Americans started to come in, they ran Everybody out. Everybody left. They, they ran away. So he went into a car and he took care of himself. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, we went. Uh, so. How did you get to New York? No, let's get to that point now. So we were, we were there and uh, I read, uh, we started to walk and we saw a little empty house with bunk beds. So mm -hmm. we went into that house, it probably was an outpost of the military or whatever. And we were, now that was our apartment and uh, every morning I looked at the paper and I read the paper and now in the paper there is an article that the Americans are looking for somebody who can run a cake bakery. <laughs> Me! <laughs> so I went up... Because your father had a bakery. That's right. So I went, I went up to the Americans and they gave me a sheet of paper and they told me to go to this and this place in Munich on the main street. When Hitler came to Munich from Berlin, mm -hmm. he stopped in that cafe. It was Café Conditorei am Dom. Okay, what's that mean? Uh, am Dom, that means uh, Conditorei uh, con, con, is a cake bakery. Okay. And am Dom is where the big uh, church was. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you went into the bakery that Hitler ate in? Yeah. Yeah, okay. So I got the cheat from the Americans and I got in. I lined up all the people. There were about 25, 28 people working there. And then I said to them, where is the boss? It comes up a big fat chairman like this. And he says to me, ich bin der Inhaber. In German, of course, and I understand, I understand German. And I said, I said to him, Du Schweinhund, raus of here. And I chased him out, so I got even what they did to my father. Wow. I ran that business, let me get to the, to the end. I ran that business for a while, I had a chauffeur, and then I met my wife, I came to my friends one day to visit them, and my wife was there. York. In New York, yes. Mm -hmm. German. Oh, in Germany? You met your wife in Germany? Of course. Oh my God! I always, for some reason, I thought you like no, randomly no, met no. her at someone's house no, in New York. No, 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 no. I met her in, I met her in Germany at, at my friend's house and we got married. And How soon after I, that? 1940. 46. How long were you, were you dating? And after the war. Not too long. Not too long. <laughs> when you know, you know. You bet. So, uh, I... Uh, and she was okay with coming to New York? Oh, yeah. yeah she was She was okay. She, she lived in a displaced person camp. Mm -hmm. I took her in. I never was in a displaced person camp. I got right away a three-bedroom apartment from the Germans. Wow. Because I worked, like I told you, I never was in a DP right. camp. So I had, a, I had a chauffeur, because when I took that business from the Germans, there were two cars there. The right. chauffeur came every morning, picked me up, took me into the business. I had a maid for my wife. Wow. And then she became pregnant. We had our daughter. 
1948 and 1950, one day I came home from the business. I was making quite a bit of money. I came home from the business. I said to my wife, you know what? We're going to America. Not to, I'm sorry, not to America. We're leaving Germany. I don't want to bring up a child in Germany. I don't want to hear that German language talking. Do you still speak it? Because some survivors won't won't even speak it anymore. German. I can I can speak German unless yeah. I have to. So you decide that you're ready to leave Germany. Right. So we uh, registered to Panama. We registered to another few countries in South America, and we registered to America. And the first acceptance came from America. Wow. Uh, you have That's to have, you have to have a sponsor, you know. You right. You couldn't just come. It's surprising because a yeah. lot of people don't know that America actually turned down the opportunity to to save people during the war. During the war, but after the war, the old, you know, the old yeah. organization and the hires, they did a lot. They helped a lot. They had fictitious people. The people who supposedly were my sponsors. Never was. <laughs> yeah, never was. But it was. It sounds like anyway. how some of the kids go to public high school today. It's, it's the fictitious home address. So you decided that you're leaving Germany. We're leaving Germany. You want to raise a child that, in America. And we left Germany on July 20th of 1950. Mm -hmm. We came in here to New York. And I started to work in a bakery as a porter right. to clean the floors and wash the pans. And, and tell me what inspired you to start your own business. Well, listen, listen. So the boss was very good to me. Every week he gave me a raise because I was doing more than three other Americans were doing in the bakery. So one day I came home and I said to my wife, I'm going to business for myself because I was making a hundred and twenty dollars a week. At that time, it was a lot of money. The average American made like fifty-five, sixty dollars a week. So I opened up. I took the paper, and they had an ad in there that they opening up a shopping center in Roslyn, and they're looking for somebody to open up a bakery. Boom! <laughs> I went there, I signed a lease for 20 years, and don't tell me that I knew what the hell I was doing. Fake it till you make it. And uh, I opened up a bakery, I made some money, I bought some real estate, and this some is of, my Some story. of the real estate you bought were sitting in right now, right? No, this, this, no, this, I, this I bought, this is a country, this is Florida. Mm -hmm. I bought real estate in New York. Oh, now I understand. So I, I left it now for my two kids. I don't want to know for nothing. Take everything. Yeah. You know? I'll leave you alone. And I am enjoying life. Julius, at your age, at 99, what, what brings you joy? What kind, what inspires you to wake up every day? Because some people my age and even in their 50s, are very depressed and some are... Well, depression to me comes pretty often because, you know, with a past like I had and the other Holocaust survivors, you know, you, you, you cannot have anything of, of happy things. Everything was, un most of the things were unhappy. But I'm trying to be nice to people. I'm trying to tell the kids, and I told you before, if I did not, uh, uh, definitely, a hundred thousand kids I definitely talked to, maybe more, and I always tell them, be good to each other. Don't pick on anybody. Nobody is better than you. you we're all the same. We all come from the same place. Yeah. And let's live like normal human beings. And sometimes, too, when you're sad and you're nice to other people, it, it makes you feel more full inside. I, uh, uh, if I can help anybody in any way, I am jumping, right? First thing. I have uh, my wife, incidentally, my wife passed away about 
three years ago. Three years? Right. Is uh, it hard to be alone? Well, Do you enjoy, because for example, for me and some people in my generation, if we're alone, we pick up our phone and we start texting 10 people because, you know, we're by ourselves. Are, are you okay being I alone? Am, I am okay now. I got myself a girlfriend. High five. <laughs> and she lived in the same building. As a matter of fact, that's the one who called a little while ago. Perfect. And she lost her husband, and I lost my wife. So we're together. You're doing it right. Same building, but different apartments. Exactly. And She's and done. your in your life, where's one of your favorite places that you you travel to, like a different country or? I don't want to travel nowhere. No, no. But in your in your life, where was somewhere that you traveled that you really loved? Florida. Yeah. Florida. I went, I told you before, when I had the bakery every Passover, closed the bakery to Florida. Wow. I stood most of the time in the diplomat, but not this one, the one yeah. before. In your, in your life, what would you say is one of the most important or maybe one of the hardest lessons that you had to learn? Well, the, the main important thing is to be nice to other people. That's very important. We all the same. We all came from the same place. Mm -hmm. Look at America. Why is America so well off? Because we have people from different countries. And everybody who comes in nowadays talking about the, 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 the other guys coming, there are some brains. Hitler, that's what Hitler wanted to get rid of. That's why he made the guest chambers. And you have no idea how many knowledgeable people we would have today more if he wouldn't kill the six million people. Mm. And I've got just two more questions. Yeah. Um, what advice do you have on, on love? for people who are looking for a partner or or it can also even be to self-love. Do you have any advice for how people can? I think you have to be nice to other people, but it's very important. Since I live with this girlfriend of mine, she doesn't do a thing and she got so many things. And she says to me today, the, the other day, she said, I don't know what I would do without you. <laughs> but uh, I always was a kid who tried to help other people. My mother was always mad <laughs> because uh, we had neighbors and the, uh, what do you call this? Come on. The curtains? The curtains. Well, the first thing that they did that with two strings you could open it up and that was something new. Today he does nothing. But then it was something new. I was the fixer. So whoever in the house needs the, if something went wrong, they could not open up, called Julius. So my mother was always with, you, when somebody calls you, you run right away. <laughs> if I need somebody, you don't want to do it. <laughs> wow. And then my, my last question is, uh, yes. this might be weird to think about, but if your parents somehow knew that you were going to live to 99 and, and have grandchildren and, and have the opportunity to, to retire in Florida, um, how, how do you think they would, they would feel or like what, what's something maybe that, that you think maybe they would say? I think I would be very happy. They would, they would be very happy. I had good parents, and uh, we were brought up nicely. We were five kids in the in our household. I yeah. Uh, when you raised your own children, did it make you think about the relationship you had with your parents? My children are raised. They. 
I have here a picture of my grandson. Yeah. And they all say he is just like me. He's got, he, must, he's got, he must have my genes. <laughs> my mom says reincarnation and is I in the have, grandchildren. I have two, totally agree. two girls uh, from my son. They are both in college. Very bright girls. Very bright. I forgot the names of the colleges. But one of them had, they gave her a choice. Any college she wanted. Wow. So I think she went to Boston, if I'm not mistaken. Do you have any regrets from your life? Regret? Mm -hmm. I don't think so. I, I feel that I did what as much as I could. I uh, I was never insulting anybody else. I was never uh, looking at you down. To me, a person is a person. Yeah. And then last question, um, material goods. Like today, and I, I'm, I'm sure maybe always, but I feel like especially in South Florida, you know, teenagers, are inspired that, you know, you need to have a, a $1,000 handbag or you need to have a designer this. And as we get older, we, you know, we tell ourselves we need designer cars and, and super large houses. Well, and I, I tell you, I do, and I am not bragging, but I give a lot of money to the Holocaust Museum in Dania here. I gave them $10,000, once I gave them $5,000, another time. Whenever there's any occasion, I, I give them money. So you think it's better but to I give cannot... money than spend it on tchotchkes or yeah, stuff? And uh, my kids are taken care of, my grandkids are taken care of with their college tuitions and everything else. And I live, to me, money, I'm not going out and just throwing out money. I cannot do that. As a matter of fact, uh, my friend Sally is sometimes criticizing me. But that I can do. Uh, I mean, if it belongs to me, why shouldn't I have it? So, uh, but on the other hand, if... Uh, you work hard. I, uh, I, I support a lot the Holocaust Museum because I want the future generations to be to know what happened and how they should live their life. Awesome. That's it. And scene. Thanks, Julius. <laughs>